Thwip, thwip, thwip. All right. It's not really what Spider-Man does, right? I'm Professor Jack. And this time on Generation Geek, we're going to talk a bit about the web slinger and maybe explore why he became as popular as he did. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. These are the words which close out the very first Spider-Man story ever. It was an eight-page story leading off what would become the final issue of Amazing Fantasy, an anthology book which, until that issue, had been called Amazing Adult Fantasy. Over the years, those eight pages launched an empire, became a corporate icon, and the character himself has become ubiquitous. Forget starring in dozens of TV shows, video games, and movies, He's also anchored numerous comic book series, and his red webbed face appears on everything from action figures to underwear. To start with, Spidey's origin story is almost as well known as his face. In its most basic original form, it goes like this. While visiting a science lab, young science geek Peter Parker, an introverted high school student, is bitten by a radioactive spider. Somehow, giving him the proportional speed and agility of the arachnid. Peter uses his newfound ability to make money and possibly indulge in a little bit of an I'll show them fantasy, letting a criminal go free because he can't be bothered to stop him as the crook runs past. Naturally, this has negative implications and in one of the wildest coincidences this side of Greek mythology, the crook breaks into Peter's home, killing his uncle Ben. When Peter, in his Spider-Man outfit, confronts the killer and realizes it's the same person he could have stopped earlier in the evening, he understands that he must devote his life to fighting crime. And all of this happens in eight pages. Not a bad job. That particular origin story has become so well known that in Spider-Man, Into the Spider-Verse, they actually make fun of it. Repeating it several times, for each iteration of the spider person from the various different universes. And always starting the retelling with, all right, let's do this one last time. Over the years, like with all comic book heroes, that origin has been tweaked and adjusted, adding details and changing minor things around. But overall, it stayed pretty consistent and pretty iconic. But that's the origin of how Peter Parker became Spider-Man. The origin of how Spider-Man came to be, it's a bit more complicated. And while it's not the focus of our talk today, we should still mention it, because it is much more convoluted than simply getting bit by a radioactive spider. Part of the problem is Stan Lee, who is famous for a number of things, but in this case, the phrase, I've told this story so many times it may actually be true, comes into play. See, according to Stan, Amazing Fantasy was going to be shutting down after issue 15, so he decided to include this character he'd come up with and see if it went anywhere. Except, there's really nothing to indicate they knew at the time the magazine was going to fold. In fact, at the end of the story, Stan, as editor, implores readers to check out the next issue for more of Spider-Man. Then there's the design of the character himself. Legend has it that Stan asked Jack Kirby to draw the book, but after getting a look at the first few pages, decided Kirby's style was more muscular than he really wanted. And we'll come back to this in a second. So instead, Stan asked Steve Ditko to take over the art chores, but Kirby still did the cover. Now, Ditko is generally acknowledged as the co-creator of the character, even by Stan himself, but then, he goes on to say that he told Steve the idea, which doesn't jive with other accounts, which show there had been discussions with Kirby, who had created a similar character called The Fly. Kirby, for his part, claims the character was a concept he had come up with back when he was working with Joe Simon, which Simon denied, and that it was he, Kirby, who brought the character to Lee, only at that point the character had a magic ring and web shooting guns. As for the costume, there's the possibility that Kirby designed a Halloween costume for a company called Ben Cooper Incorporated in the 50s for a character called, you guessed it, 
Spider-Man. Oh boy, yeah. Now, while that costume was yellow, it did have the webs and spider motif we'd come to associate with the Peter Parker version designed by Ditko a few years later. Because when tasked with designing the actual character, Kirby had him as an older, much more muscular adventurer with goggles. Needless to say, these are credits which will be debated long after we're all gone. All we know for sure is we've got that origin story and Peter Parker is a nerdy, put-upon teenage science geek who Stan didn't want to be popular or muscular or anything like what was happening in comics at the time. At least, not in the alter ego part of the story. Sure, Spider-Man can be the muscular superhero we all know and love, but what makes the character more interesting is Peter Parker, the boy behind the mask. And that is what we want to talk about. Eh, at least partly. We're also going to talk about that mask itself, but give me a minute to get there. With Parker, though, we get something rather unique, a teen hero. Sure, there had been lots of teen heroes previously. During the golden age of comics, basically from the start of Superman in 1938 through the end of World War II or so, almost every major character had a teen sidekick. You don't have to look further than the boy wonder, Robin himself, to see what I'm talking about. Captain America had his sidekick, Bucky. And there were many others, but they were all sidekicks. Secondary characters in support of their hero. Of course, there was Billy Batson, but he was only a powerless boy when he was a civilian. As soon as he said the word, So you say it? Like, Shazam? He became an adult with powers. On the flip side, Kirby had also given the world the boy commandos, but they didn't actually have any superpowers. They were basically a street gang who went overseas to fight the Nazis. And honestly, even though they were meant to be kids, they never read like kids. Instead, they felt like miniature adults. But come early 1962, Lee, understand, I know the controversies, but we'll take the approach here that the easiest answer is the simplest. Lee took the idea of a teenage hero to publisher Martin Goodman. Lee remembers it this way. He gave me a thousand reasons why Spider-Man would never work. Nobody likes spiders. It sounds too much like Superman. And how could a teenager be a superhero? Then I told him I wanted the character to be a very human guy. Someone who makes mistakes, who worries, who gets acne, has trouble with his girlfriend, things like that. Goodman replied, he's a hero, he's not an average man. I said, no, we make him an average man who happens to have superpowers. That's what will make him good. He told me I was crazy. Maybe he was, but it was something new and fresh. Not only did Stan want a teenager to be the primary hero, sure, he'd had a teenage hero in the form of Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, as part of the Fantastic Four, but Spidey was on his own. And then he added in all the troubles a regular, normal teenager has, coupled with the idea that he not only had to deal with all of that, but he had to do it while fighting bad guys. The other thing Lee claims he told Goodman was he would write the whole of Spider-Man in a tongue-in-cheek manner. Yet another thing to mark a difference in the character. He quips and cavorts and doesn't take anything seriously. Being under the mask becomes the perfect outlet for all the sarcasm he builds up in his civilian life. Just like you change when you're all dressed up to go out, Peter slips on the mask and becomes the biggest smartass there is. Then, just for fun, let's make this guy a hero for the common man. While the Fantastic Four were going to space, dealing with earth-shaking villains like Doctor Doom, and the Incredible Hulk was a brutish monster, Spider-Man, the third major character to come out of the newly creative powerhouse that was Marvel Comics, was your friendly neighborhood superhero. Now, add in the idea that the press, in the form of Daily Bugle publisher J. Jonah Jameson, for my money, the best non-supervillain there ever was, hates Spider-Man and wants to see him caught, captured, or dead. I want that wall-crawling arachnid prosecuted! We've got something totally new. 
Now, let's recap this for a second and see if we can't figure out why he became as popular as he did as quickly as he did. One, teen hero. He was the same age as a lot of his readers. Two, dealing with teenage problems. You've got homework issues, so does he. I got homework. Right, I'm gonna pretend you didn't say that. No, I I'm being serious. The weight of the world is on his shoulders. Don't we sometimes all feel like we've got to do everything? Four, not appreciated for what we do and blamed for what we didn't. Sounds like a typical teenager to me. Now, let's talk about the mask. See, with all this other stuff going on, one of the most interesting things about the design of Spidey's costume is that there's nothing to give away any of his features. The Fantastic Four don't wear masks, neither does the Hulk. Over on the other side, at DC, the heroes who don't show their faces pretty much all wear a mask or a cowl, something to cover their eyes, but not their whole face. Spider-Man, he can be anyone. We don't know who he is, so he can be whoever we want or need him to be. No matter what we look like, it could be someone like us under the mask. Okay, except if we're girls. But at that point, the common belief was more boys were reading comics. I'm not excusing it, mind you, just adding a little bit of context. And anyway, soon enough, there were women heroes, and now there's even an alternate universe where Gwen Stacy, Spider-Man's former girlfriend, is a spider hero herself. Hey guys. Wanda? Honestly. We could look at nothing but Spider-Man and the influence his comic book has had for our next several episodes and not run out of things to talk about. Personally, I think this comic was responsible for ending the Silver Age of comics, and it was definitely responsible for breaking the hold of the Comic Code Authority. Something else we'll talk about in the future. From the early 70s, he's been featured in several different regularly published titles, including The Spectacular Spider-Man, Peter Parker, The Amazing Spider-Man, and Marvel Team-Up, where different characters each issue would team up with Spidey. The character even showed up in the educational kids' TV program, The Electric Company, helping teach moral lessons. And this was the first live-action Marvel comic character in more than 30 years, since Captain America had appeared in a film serial in 1944. For good measure, the show and Marvel co-produced the comic book Spidey Super Stories, specifically for the younger set. The comic, aimed at six to 10 year olds, had a lower vocabulary bar than the regular comic, but unlike the TV version, which had no connection to the Marvel Universe, the comic let Spidey interact with other characters, thus drawing new readers into the world of comics. Over the years, Peter Parker's grown up and gotten married and had kids, and, and yes, both wife and child became superheroes too. He's gone from being the geeky outsider to being a common Joe. Sure, he exchanged teen problems for adult ones, but through it all, he's maintained that sense of humor and even his own sense of wonder at actually being Spider-Man. So there you go, a brief, very brief introduction to one of the most iconic of comic book figures. The guy who does whatever a spider can. I'm Professor Jack. See you next time here on Generation Geek. If you like what you just saw, remember to hit the subscribe button and click for notifications so that you'll know every time Generation Geek has a new video out. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're there, and if you want to meet us in person, come check out Comic-Con Baltics this year. We'll see you there.